London, 1872. I have entered into the service of a new gentleman. It would seem he is a gambling man. Hello everyone, this is Vanguard of Valor here today. Welcome back. Today we're going to be playing something a little bit different, a little bit unusual. It's going to be a bit of a more casual experience as we explore a mysterious world full of strange and unusual events. We're playing... Ah, oh, I missed it. <laughs> I tried to predict when it was going to give us the title card here. But, the point is, we are going to be playing... 80 days. There we go. Got a second try. That's still just as good, right? Anyway, we're playing a little bit of 80 days here for you in basically a recreation of the story of Jules Verne in a very strange alt history world. We're going to be traveling the world from city to city, trying to make it all the way back to London in 80 days. Things will be conspiring against us or working in our favor as we go, but for now, we just have to begin in London. This is actually my third playthrough of the game, I think. I've played through it twice already. Once where I did make it around the world in 80 days, and once where I missed it by like three days. So hopefully we'll have a good adventurous run here, but we'll find out. Let's begin. My master returned from the Reform Club with a strange gleam in his eye. Passport said he. We're going around the world. Pack my cloak and my evening jacket. There is not a moment to waste. We, Passport 2, now have funds. We have 4,000 pounds to make this journey around the world, but we'll see what we can do to make it really happen. Alrighty. In London, we can start by packing. We have a couple different things we can bring with us. As we go, we can purchase new bags, and we can take more stuff with us from various cities we visit to sell onwards or to give us benefits on our journey. But we start off right now with just a single bag with some wool trousers and wool shirts inside. If we take the evening jacket, we have the Englishman's wardrobe, and that'll give us the full package. So we'll take that with us, why not? There we go. We could take a top hat with us instead, and then a traveling cloak, which will give us the Gentleman Traveler set. And that's good for keeping out the cold and the rain. The evening jacket here is just a nice, fancy set of clothes. So I think what we might actually wind up doing here is we might swap something out. Might get rid of the, uh, the wool shirts here and take the top hat and the traveling cloak because I'm more interested in having the protection from the cold because you never know what you're going to run up against when you're exploring the world. We'll leave the Indian train table because I don't have any immediate plans to go to India, but we might wind up there eventually. Now that we're packed, our completed gentleman traveler set should protect against uncomfortable conditions and help us negotiate times of upper class journeys. So you can see bringing packages actually with you gives you active benefits as we journey. This hundred here is our master, Phineas Fogg's health, and uh, let us depart. There's lots of things we have to manage as we're trying to make this work out. We could head up to Cambridge. I'm not sure where we'd go from there. We could go down to Paris instead. There's lots of cities to go to though, and you can see my previous route on the map right here. It was a fairly circuitous one, and it's not necessarily surprising that it didn't really work out as I had intended, as it wound up going a fairly long way around the world. <laughs> but we're going to explore and see what happens. So we're going to start out today by heading over to Cambridge. The route to Cambridge is via mail car. It'll arrive today, departs before 9pm, so we've got plenty of time. It lets us take one bag with us, and costs us five health, as it's not the most uh, high-class journey. But we're going to travel there anyway, and see what we can do in Cambridge. Carriage roof has space for one suitcase, like we said, and it's the open road, which is somewhat bothersome to our health, but that's fine. Let's go. We begin our 80-day journey around the world. This is a fairly casual and adventurous game. You may have noticed that our horse is a robot, but so it goes. We hurried downstairs, only to find a carriage was already waiting. I looked to Monsieur Fogg, but he was as surprised as I was. The Charing Cross, my master shouted as he clambered in, but the cabbie leant down and shook his head. Sorry, Governor, he replied. I've been sent to pick you up and take you to Cambridge. But we're going around the world, I protested. I don't know about that, the cabbie replied, but I have my instructions. The man whipped the horses, the magnetic tips of the lash connecting with the spark igniters on the machine's flanks, and then we were off, rattling along the cobbles, heading north. Hmm. This is a calamity, I declared, 
of Monsieur Fogg gestured me to silence. It is no doubt my old college wishing to encourage me to make a donation, he replied sagely. Well, perhaps they will have something to offer our cause as well. How could he be so calm when all hung in the balance? Such, of course, was his way. Now, if memory, if memory serves, the challenge here is that we are doing this for a $10,000 bet. So if we can make it around the world spending less than $10,000, we come up with a profit. We flew up the Great North Road, the carriage showing an amazing turn of speed that pleased my master greatly. This is no normal phaeton, I remarked. Indeed not, he replied. It seems our learned friends have been busy. I have great hopes for this little diversion, Passepartout. And with that, we fell into silence until we arrived a few short hours later. To Cambridge we go. Hmm. Well, it's now night time. It's 11 p.m., so we'll need to sleep in order to do anything else in the next day. So we'll sleep and pass the day. And wake up nice and early in the next morning. The carriage set us down outside the gates to Trinity College. The cabby tipped his hat, and I tipped him. We'll be nice. The things that we do actually do have an effect on our character and the things that we can do in the future. So I think, for now, we'll be nice. We'll give him a little bit of money. And I tipped him, for despite our rough displacement, we've been treated most courteously, and one does well to ensure the lower working classes are fairly rewarded. My master, on the other hand, was cheerfully striding inside, nodding to the porter at the gate, whom he appeared to know by name. I hurried to catch up, and caught my master just in time as a daunting figure in a long black robe swooped from a doorway, more or less gathering Monsieur Fogg up in a cloud. You think he's an assassin? A thief? A lunatic? No, I think he's a professor. I waited for an introduction to be made. The figure stood back and declared itself to be Professor Infrey, head of thaumatology at the college. You must be passport too, he declared, rounding on me cheerfully. Tell me, do you prefer coffee or Madeira? Hmm... What do we prefer here? We're we're in a dangerous position. We have to choose something. I'm going to say that Passport 2 prefers coffee. The professor peered a moment longer, then straightened up and laughed. Well done, Phileas. You've chosen an excellent man here. I'm sure the two of you will go far. I chose correctly, it sounds like. His eyes twinkled. Very far indeed. Come with me. As we followed the strange loping academic... Do I hiss to my master for explanation, or glance this way and that? Let's look around. I glanced this way and that, down the resounding stone corridors and up curling wooden staircases. The place was quiet, except for the occasional hurrying youth, all of whom bowed their heads to the professor as we passed. Clearly in awe of some feature of this curious bird. We arrived eventually at his study, an island of a desk surrounded by a small library that had carelessly tumbled out of its shelves. I hear you're going around the world, Phileas, the professor remarked, and we would like to offer you some assistance. That is most generous, Monsieur Fogg remarked. <laughs> Not really, the professor replied. You're a Trinity man. Your expedition will be for the glory of Trinity College. We will put you in our periodical, you see. It will annoy Oxford terribly. It seemed a fair trade. Still, the idea that this strange old gentleman could help our cause was intriguing, and I leant in to hear what was on offer. But, declared the professor, enough business. First, you will dine with us in hall. I have gowns ready for you, and, young man, he turned to me, servants are not usually allowed to dine at high table, but we will make an exception. Come. So, for the first night of our great journey, we dined with silverware and candlelight, under the beady eyes of somber portraits, and in conversation with a flock of erratically minded men and women whose discussions turned on a sixpence from Irish passage tombs to aeronautical wingtip design. I became thoroughly overexcited, and when we retired to bed, it was with a smile on my lips and a cry of, What a marvelous adventure! on my tongue. Our funds have gone down a touch. All right, well, let's explore a little bit and see what goes on here in Cambridge. There could be some valuable things for us. We rose, breakfasted in the hall more somberly, soberly rather, and met the professor on the roof. This is what we've been working on, he declared, waving to a folded contraption in front of us. Did it resemble a sleeping bird or a pile of mangled coat hangers? No, we're being an optimistic passepartout. A gyrodyne, 
the professor continued, powered by the rise of evaporating water through micropores. Most interesting. We were thinking of testing her across the North Sea. We thought you might pilot her. A gyrodyne? Or we were going east, not north? Let's ask what it is. A gyrodyne? I declared. Is she fast? Oh, extremely. We can have you in Christiania within six hours, so long as she doesn't crash. The man beamed. So, we are agreed. You will take her. That sounds very safe. <laughs> Alright, we're going north this run, I guess. Not quite what I had originally in mind, but uh, could be interesting. Let's take a look at the market and see what they're selling here, because buying things is an important and integral part of playing this game. Alright, in here we could buy Loaded Dice, part of the Left of the Law set. Or we could buy a first edition Coleridge, which is very valuable in Munich. First edition copy of the poems of Samuel Taylor Coleridge. It's 60 pounds here, but worth much, much more in Munich. Problem is, we're not really heading in the Munich direction right now if we're going up north. If we take a look at the actual globe here... If we wanted to go to Munich... Well... Yeah, because Munich is in the opposite direction that we're going, so I have a feeling we're not going to get there, so it doesn't make sense to buy that. We're going to take our Gyrodyne over to Christiania. It's going to give us space for three bags and cost us 14 health, but we should be able to manage it. Let's see what our journey entails. The Gentleman's Traveler set makes it not quite so bad, because the rust skies and cold weather are managed somewhat. Let's take our experimental Gyrocopter. What could possibly go wrong? Here goes nothing. Now on a journey like this, we'll get some things normally that happen en route. So while we're traveling, we can discover more adventures. The pilot touched a control, and the gyrodyne began to smoke and hiss. We clambered quickly aboard. Next stop, Europe, the pilot declared. The great craft unfolded its wings, seemed to pause a moment as it waited for a gust of something. And then we were up, up and away into the air. We're flying on an experimental gyrocopter. Let's see how Fog's doing. Ah, we did a little bit of uh, cleaning up on him. That's not always good. We can tend to him, make sure his health is improved as we journey. The journey across the North Sea was surprisingly brief. The little bird craft bouncing up and down in the air, it seemed to collect water vapor, rise, dry out, and then fall, and then repeat the process. What happens if we fall too far? I asked cautiously. Then we collect a lot of water all at once and shoot back up, the pilot said. It's all very clever. Finally, we settled down on the shores of Norway. A successful test? I asked. Oh, we knew it worked, the pilot said. But the professor wants to say you started your journey with one of ours. Good for the copy. Of course. So it's all for the, uh... It's all for the propaganda, but so it goes. We've arrived in Christiania. Oh, excuse me there. I accidentally kicked the microphone. That's probably going to be pretty loud. Well, I guess we stay in the hotel and see what our adventure holds in the future. As we travel this strange world, there's all kinds of things to see. Oh, look at our health drop. That's not good. The streets of Christiania were completely deserted. We did not see anyone anywhere. We found a hotel in the end, but it was deserted and cold, and there was no dining to be had. Monsieur Fogg seemed quite unruffled. We will leave money on the counter, he declared, and perhaps a note that their service could be improved. The night's cold here. Luckily we brought a warm layer with us, or the stars came out over the empty city. What happened here? Who knows? Luckily we brought a warm layer with us. The woolen cloak blunted the edge of the chill. Got a little bit of our health back. Well now, this journey is proving more tiring than I expected. No kidding. Let's explore the deserted city of Christiania. It's worth mentioning as well that because of the different routes that we've taken, there are lots of places that I've never been in this game. So we're going to try and travel to places that are new and see what happens. The city was still empty. Was I convinced we'd arrived during a festival? Was I quite puzzled? Or was I put in mind of what had happened to Belgrade? Hmm. We're an optimistic passepartout right now. We'll be convinced we've arrived during a festival and everyone's just out. I was convinced we'd arrived during a festival, though I knew of none, and had assumed the Norwegians to some variety of Christian, much like the greater portion of Europe. Hm, this is an eerie place, Monsieur Fogg remarked, in an uncharacteristic display of emotion. Certainly, the silent streets had a certain menace to them. 
Perhaps we should be moving on, or we must find the municipal center, the government. Let's investigate. I want to know more about this place. I replied, a city cannot be left totally abandoned. A little more walking and we came to the parliament building, and beside it a set of freshly built steps leading down into the ground. The passage was lit by gas lamps. I paused at the entrance. Shall we go below, or shall we listen? Let's be cautious and listen at the entrance. And heard a very faint, and heard very faintly a rattling sound emerging. Monsieur Fogg cocked his head. Cartwheels he deduced, and singing. We went below, and sure enough, there were lights, and then shops, and then people, and carriages, and, and restaurants, and indeed an entire city built beneath the surface. Did we demand to know the meaning of this construction, or why these people have moved their entire city downwards? I did not care. Let's ask. And we eventually found a man called Arne Garborg, a poet, visiting from the countryside. There's war coming, he explained. We're sure of it. Hmm. So this is a defense. He nodded. If we are used to it now, we will not suffer when the bombing begins. When the fighting begins, there will be airships carrying bombs in the skies. It'll be better below. I was astonished by his unflappable calm. What of the sun? I demanded. But he looked at me only scathingly and did not reply. We spent a little while browsing markets, would you find somewhere to eat? Hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. My voice is fighting a little bit, but we'll do what we can. Let's browse the markets and see what they're selling in the underground city. Of which there were plenty here below, though I found little of interest except a chess set with pieces made of finely carved ar walrus ivory. Yours for a hundred pounds, the vendor declared. It's highly valuable. You know what? Let's, uh, let's take a risk here. Let's buy this thing. I paid her and packed the set carefully away into a case. It was a fine souvenir, but looked like it also might be worth something in trade. Our funds have gone down by a fair amount. The Norwegian chess set should face a fetch a good price in Rome should we decide to sell it. <laughs> that is a little bit further away than I was planning on going, but that's fine. Check our bags here. We have a second bag that we've actually acquired as well, worth six thousand three hundred pounds in Rome. Wow. Not bad for a hundred pound purchase. Unfortunately, we have to get to Rome to sell it there. And Rome is... No, I don't want to... Ah, uh, that's not what I meant to do. <laughs> I wanted to see the world map, not see the overview of our entire journey so far. That's fine, we'll go to planning and see here. Now, Rome is far below us. Far below us. So we're not going to be able to sell it there. We could head to Tromso, arrive tomorrow, head over to Stockholm and arrive tomorrow, or we could head to Copenhagen. I'm interested in heading further north and seeing what mysteries we can find up at the top of the world. If we were to try and head there, it'll cost us 680 pounds. It arrives tomorrow and departs tomorrow, so it's a fast journey. It'll be fairly uh, healthy for us, but also fairly expensive. The journey to Stockholm is much cheaper at only 66 pounds. Hmm. We can't go this way today, of course, but it might be an easier way to actually save on funds. You know what? I think we'll head to Tromso anyway. I'm not super concerned about being the most economical right now. I want to go north early and see if we can, like, cheat and loop around the North Pole and then zip back down the other side and get there super fast. <laughs> might not be our most... A uh, common journey around the world, but we'll see what happens. Let's depart for Tromso tomorrow. So for now, we'll go back to the city of Christiania, and we'll spend the night here. Now that we're actually in a nice hotel, we should be able to sleep the day without having the terrible uh, rest and recuperation problems that we had otherwise. There we go, we healed a bit up. With what remained of the day, I spent a few hours walking around and succeeded only in having my pocket picked to the tune of 29 pounds. Well, that's unfortunate. Time to depart. Let us go. This journey will be a glorious one, and now we head for Tromsø. I have no idea how to pronounce that, but we're heading there on the Fjordic Flyer. Cold winds and high weather. We're going to not lose any health as a result of the, uh, of the weather because of our, our gear. But we have to be careful, because the time ticks while we're on the map, so even if we feel like we're safe, we have to be careful we don't miss our departure times. 
We found ourselves at an airship dock, blowing clouds of white steam from our mouths as we waited to board. The captain, a shockingly blonde lady with stern, sculpted features, brought us tin cups of hot tea and insisted on punching us each on the arm. I punched back in comradely, in comradely fashion and she frowned, but beyond that there was no particular rebuke, except, of course, from my master. "'It is good to have for a pilot to have some spirit,' he remarks. "'It suggests they might not be totally helpless in circumstances of some pressure.' He boarded the airship soon after, and lifted up, ready to trace the delicate lacework of the Norwegian coastline on our way north. "'Let's, uh, converse.' "'I'm at your service, Mr. Fogg. That's part two. So we can talk about all kinds of different things. We can talk about the places we're going and see if they know anything about them. We can talk about things that we have or play a game here, it looks like, which is pretty cool. Let's try that. Let's use the Norwegian chess set. I've never seen this before. A game of chess, monsieur. <laughs> that would be most when most entertaining. And Fogg's well-being improved somewhat. There you go. He enjoyed playing chess with us. That's pretty cool. Now we can check, talk about Tromso and see what he knows. Have you heard that Tromso is linked to Helsinki by freight train, but the journey is a tiring one? We can ask about other places as well. We can ask different people. We're not always asking Monsieur Fogg what he knows, but if we ask him about these kinds of things, we can improve the way. Or we can use our gear on us to improve our situation as well. If we use our traveling cloak, that should improve our health as well. Somewhat, anyway. And there we go. New routes have been discovered from Tromso all the way back down south to Helsinki. Discovering these routes is actually fairly important, though, because if you don't find them, you can't use them. And sometimes talking to people is the only way to get them. I confess a certain bafflement as to my master's intentions with this particular leg of his journey. Perhaps we just circumnavigate from north to south and back? That's my plan. Might travel down the Americas to Cape Horn and then across the very bottom of the world to Australia. Of course, to cross even one pole was an absurd idea. Or any serious pole or expedition would be properly equipped. Or that would be most decidedly against the spirit of the wager. Hmm. Let's say that any serious polar expedition would be properly equipped, rather than traveling with a few suitcases. Towards evening, the airship descended towards a small fishing town, nestled between two dramatic slopes. It was, I think, the smallest place I had ever seen. Tromso is apparently a tiny little town. Well, let's get there and find out what's going on. The traveling cloak could earn us well here. Interesting. We could sell our cloak. Let's take a look at our plans. Right now, the only route we know is the one back down to Helsinki, which is unfortunate, because that's not where I want to go. But, if we take a nap here and explore the next day, we might learn some new routes. So let's sleep. There we go. Tromso by night was no more endearing, and it was substantially colder. I did little but wander in a state of some isolation until I stumbled upon a bar in which several fishermen and women were playing chess matches. It was hardly fine entertainment, but I won a few matches, which at least let me feel I had achieved some part of my cultural duties as a traveler. We are now dependable. Let's explore and see what's going on. What happens in Tromso? Aha! We found another route northwards! To Smirenberg! I walked the streets of Tromso. Pleasant enough, perambulation, thanks to the dramatic slopes and the great glacial lagoon. Hmm... There's a university, they tell me, though I cannot think who would endure such cold just to read books. But my ire was quickly stirred to keep me warm when I encountered one Mademoiselle Fleischer, who stopped me on the street to ask without irony if it was a pleasure for one such as myself to visit her city. I flattered her, of course, but my gallantry was quickly put to the test by her next remark. "'You are the ambassador we've been promised,' she continued. "'From the Paris of the Europe to this, the Paris of the North.' We have been promised a liaison between our cities for many years now. Who else would you be? Tromso is the second capital of Norway, you know. Hmm. Do we play the part impeccably, or do we tell her that we're traveling around the world? We've been uh, fairly positive, but I think we're going to play the part and see what happens. But that could get us in a lot of trouble, you know. We don't want to be mad. We're not going to be mad. That's, that's not the passport two we are. We're either going to play along, or we're going to tell her the truth. I think we're going to play along. I played the part impeccably, bowing low and asking if she could provide me with a suitable tour. She took my arm, and we swept through the streets of the city. There were perhaps eleven of them, before settling to an enjoyable glass of aquavit and a slice of brunost by the shore of the ice-cold lake. The mademoiselle's eyes drifted northwards. Have you ever wondered about the top of the world? 
she asked dreamily. You are an adventuress, mademoiselle. She laughed. No, no, I'm not. I'm an empty-headed fool. But sometimes I wonder what might be hidden up there, do you know? We talked for a while of frozen wastes, and I fear I promised I would one day take her to see Paris. Only five days into this journey of ours, and I fear I'm making promises I cannot keep. Well, we may have adventures already. So we'll check out the marketplace. Here, we can get an amethyst, we get a buffalo hide, or a fur coat. We're going to want to get some serious, uh, some serious warmth. Otherwise, we're going to be in trouble here. I think buying that fur coat is a good idea. It's only 72 pounds, so we can afford it, and I think it'll be very valuable. The amethyst is valuable in Ekat... <laughs> Ekat... I don't know how to say that one. Ekaterinburg, Minsk, and Istanbul. Hmm. It's not very expensive to take, but... Where is Ekaterinburg? If we take a look at the globe here... Do we know where Ekaterinburg is? I have no idea. I don't see it on the map anywhere. Minsk, Moscow... Is that Ekaterinburg? That's St. Petersburg. I have no idea where Ekaterinburg is. There's the North Pole. We're gonna travel north, because as much as I don't think it's a good idea, we're gonna give it a try. This hot air balloon departs for Smirenburg tomorrow at 8 a.m. It's gonna be very bad for our health, but it lets us bring all of our gear, so that'll have to do. Alright. Well, we'll spend the night here, and then head our way further up north towards the North Pole. Who knows what we'll find up there, but I guess it'll be an adventure. We spend the rest of the day in Tromso. As night fell, I engaged another guest in conversation to find out what I could, hearing from him that some buyers will pay well for fur coats from Minsk. A most interesting snippet. All right, nothing useful to us right now, but that's fine. We're going to depart. Oh, it departs tomorrow? No, it arrives tomorrow. Perfect. We're going to embark, embark on the Pomor hunting balloon. Sounds interesting. Two suitcases, but the fur coat from our Russian gentleman's wardrobe completely protects us from the cold. Let us go. Traveling in a most unusual balloon. <laughs> I've arranged transport for us, Monsieur Fogg said, cool as a cucumber. Do we really spit at our tea? Do we complain or do we ask where we're going? Let's ask where we're going. Where are we headed, Monsieur? I asked in interest. He shuffled his newspaper. We are going north. He took a sip of tea. Very north. Let's hold our tongue and wait for him to say what he has to say. My master was in a strange mood, and I found myself intrigued. Smirenberg, he said, showing me the location marked on his almanac. It was indeed very north. Perhaps even very, very north. And, and then? Monsieur Fogg looked up at me, a gleam in his eyes. Sometimes, Passepartout, he said slowly, the best way to untie a knot is not to untie it at all. One must simply slice through it. Hmm. The Alexandrian solution, from myth. I murmured, and I fancy his cool blue eyes warmed a little. Though, monsieur, if you are Alexander the Great, does that make me... We say he's his steed? Nah, we'll say he's his general. Hephaestion. I cast my eyes down as after I spoke the words, aware of my presumption. Hephaestion was more than Alexander's general. He was a friend, perhaps even more than a friend, or a friend, a bodyguard, an alter ego. And I was but a valet. Monsieur Fogg merely took a breath and rustled his newspaper, and ordered me to ready our bags to depart soonest. I found myself entirely full of gratitude for his habit of stiff reserve. My relationship with Fogg has improved. All right, if we converse with somebody, we might be able to learn some interesting things here. Let's uh, take a chat. Is it Fogg again? Mm, we're talking with Fogg again. Let's ask him about what he thinks about Smearenberg. He might have some interesting stuff for us. Regrettably, nothing. Ah, well. Well, let's, uh, let's play some more chess. Improve his health. And let's uh, use the traveling cloak to warm him up a little bit, too. There we go. Very good. We'll be there in no time. The captain of our balloon was a dark-browed woman by the name of Yana Starostina. "'What exactly is it you hunt?' we asked her, eyeing a set of large harpoons lashed furly to the upper deck. "'Whales, walruses, reindeer,' the captain answered jovially enough. "'Even polar bears sometimes.' "'Bears?' 
Do I pale? Is it, are you also a hunter? I inquired, with a glance at the livid scars across her cheek. I was, once, she said equably. Maybe I will be again, once my little ones have grown. It would be very irresponsible to allow myself to be eaten by a walrus just now. With that, she was summoned to the navigation room, and I retired to our cabin to rest. Interesting. We're almost there. What happens in Smearenburg? The balloon seemed to make good time to the colder air. Below stretched an endless, ice-like sea. I was surprised to see it quite alive. We saw diving creatures and streaking fish shoals, and at least once the rise and slap of a whale. I asked our captain if there were many people here in the north. She laughed. There are enough to start an argument, she replied. More than enough for that. And then we were sinking lower, and we watched a whaling ship bring in a bleeding leviathan from the sea as we settled down to land. And here we are, in Smearenburg. Well, this is where we're going to have to stop this episode for now, folks. Thank you very much for watching our mysterious north-south vision of our journey around the world in 80 days. So far, it's going well enough, but we'll see how we can hold out as our funds dwindle and our health deteriorates. Let me know what you thought about in the comments, though, and I'll see you next time. Until then, bye bye